On this edition of Independent Sources, Poland's economy thriving while others are just surviving. Black filmmakers highlighting the common experiences of the African diaspora. And Latino and Jewish combining cultural roots and religion to foster a community within a community. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. And I'm Viano Ravinka. Greece was burning just last week, and it could be said that Ireland's luck ran out as the wave of economic austerity measures took hold in these European countries. There are two countries making troubling headlines as Europe tries to stave off the brunt of the global economic downturn. However, Poland is quietly holding fast, solidifying its position as the sixth largest economy in the European Union. Although there are no exact figures as yet, there have been reports of a brand gain as some Poles return home to try their hand at making a new life in their old towns. Some members of Poland's government are touting the country's progress and predict a coming out party of sorts for the country in 2011. I sat down with two Polish reporters, Andrzej Dobrowolski and John Chop, to talk about Poland's resilience. So we've been hearing that Poles are going back to Poland. How is this obvious here in the U.S., Andre? Oh, it is obvious, particularly for our paper, because we have uh, less and less readers who decide to go. And when we talk to some people who have businesses, stores, etc., they keep telling us the same story, that since in Poland the situation is much better than over here, particularly those people who were undocumented immigrants decide to go back to Poland because, first of all, in Poland they can make much more money than they used to make. I remember when I uh, lived in Poland, you could survive easily uh, making $20 a month. Suddenly everything was much cheaper if you could pay, you, if you have to pay two, three dollars for an, an apartment, twenty dollars was enough to, 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 to live. Uh, now salaries are much higher and on the other hand a lot of people can work uh, without any problems in mm -hmm. countries of European, Europe's, uh, European Union, so they decide to, to, to go there. We'll discuss the, uh, the reason for which people uh, might be going back home uh, in a minute. We'll discuss them at length. But uh, again, uh, Andre, you're saying that businesses are affected here by people going back home? Certainly they are, and we know it from the first hand. Because when we ask why people don't put some ads in our paper, they say that before when they uh, advertise, they, uh, that the companies in, in, in our paper, they could have 20, 30 people. Uh, right now, nobody comes. So instead of uh, going to us, they put the ads in, for example, Latino papers. Yes, that was a point that the um, foreign minister um, of Poland, Radosław Sikorski, recently made in the November 22nd issue of The Economist. He pointed out that Poland's economy is very robust. Poland is not in the Eurozone, and Poland is the sixth largest measured by population country in the European Union, and the seventh largest measured by its economy. And Poland's economy is well balanced. Uh, there's no one sector that has a particular comparative advantage over another, but it, Poland still doesn't have a consumer society the way the United States does. You really can't go and get a, a, a mortgage loan in Poland, for instance. Uh, speaking of the Polish government, um, people who come from the United States are actually um, given, um, according to Wall Street John Journal, 11,700 uh, euros to start a business in, in Warsaw. Um, how would that money help someone who comes from the United States? Well, that seed money would have to be clearly put together with loans from family members, loans from others, because 11,000 doesn't really seem like 
uh, the, a company would be sufficiently capitalized. Can you think of any company that one could launch with 11,000 euros in I don't. I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I have never heard about this money, but it might be true. But people manage somehow to, to, to make their businesses. If they want to, they can get some loans from uh, Western banks, from European banks, not necessarily from, from Poland. But business is not easy right now in Poland also because of the, even if Poland, as you mentioned, uh, survived somehow the recession, but the situation is still very, very uncertain. And a lot of people, even they started their businesses, they might experience some problems. But the country is, uh, is doing well. So uh, again, John, what are the reasons for which uh, Poland is currently the uh, sixth largest economy in uh, the European Union? Well, uh, uh, Poland is the sixth largest measured by population, seventh largest measured by Economic. gross domestic product. Mm -hmm. And in 2008, uh, Poland had a GDP of $550 billion. And Americans need to compare that with some 15 trillion, which is America's gross domestic product. So by that standard, Poland is still very small. But as uh, Foreign Minister Sikorsky mentioned, who spent quite a bit of time in the United States uh, at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, Poland's uh, political system has shown a great deal of resilience in this year of uh, exceptional tragedy following the um, the uh, tragic crash of President uh, Kaczynski's um, airplane at Smolensk Military Airfield on April 10, 2010. Poland um, was able to bounce back from that, um, had presidential elections, and uh, now has a government in place that uh, uh, Foreign Minister Sikorsky considers is on very good terms with Poland's two very large neighbors, Germany and Russia. I want to switch uh, back to talking about um, um, immigration here and actually the tougher uh, crackdowns on illegal immigration and how might this be a cause in Poles going back home. Andre, uh, do Poles feel more pressure uh, nowadays with uh, this tougher approach to immigration? Well, certainly they do and as they mentioned it is the reason that they decide to go back to Poland rather than experience some problems with the immigration uh, office or with, with, with the police. When they go to Europe, when they go to Germany, when they go to France, Great Britain and Ireland, they don't have any problems like this. They Traveling and working, they can work freely within Europe. They can work Europe, freely, yeah. they have benefits, they have retirement, they have insurance, so you cannot even compare. But the other thing is that it is unemployment in the United States high unemployment. They cannot uh, get jobs even if they have, uh, they are legally in the United States. So, And is it that most uh, Polish people here used to work in the transportation and construction industries which were hard hit by the economic recession? Yes, that's, that's, that's the reason that they decide to go back to Poland. Now, this is not the first time in history when uh, Poles went back home. Um, analysts say that it happened before, right after Poland gained independence in 1918, and that uh, should uh, the uh, U.S. economy boom again, Poles will, will come right back. Uh, what are the prospects? A lot of it has to do with uh, demographics. Poland's population today is uh, stagnant, if not falling. Back in 1918, at the time of the Second Polish Republic, uh, there was a great deal of uh, population pressure versus arable land in Poland. And Poland was an agricultural country at that point, and many decided to uh, try their luck in America. Many were recruited by textile companies, uh, mostly German textile companies with American branches. Northern New, Jer New Jersey, one thinks of the uh, Forstmann Company, the great woolen manufacturers, who would uh, go into these uh, villages in central Poland and uh, recruit people to go to the United States. I, I really don't foresee that happening again because America has switched from a manufacturing economy to a financial services economy. So I, I really don't see that. I think that what Andre said is far more likely that with Poland in the European Union, those Poles who can't find economic opportunities in Poland that suit them will go to uh, the United Kingdom, Ireland, other countries in the European Union where um, they can find jobs 
and where they can return to Poland on holiday um, a lot less expensively because it, uh, it's a lot closer. And on the other hand, the United States don't invite Polish people or any immigrants to come freely. There is a problem with visas. Poland doesn't belong to the program of visa waiver. And Poland have a very tough time to, to, to come to this country. Even some uh, very well educated uh, people have the same difficulties because this number of visas is limited and they rather choose to work either in Poland or in Europe. Andrzej Dobrowolski, John Chop, thank you very much for being here today with us. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come on independent sources, is it easier for independent black filmmakers in the much debated post-racial era? Before that, Abby Shola has some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. Councilman Charles Barron says New York City should be a Walmart-free zone. The Amsterdam News reports that the retail giant has its sights set on moving into Queens again. Councilman Barron and other city leaders say Walmart's low pay rate and lack of employee benefits would be bad for the economy. Walmart's recent survey shows that over 50 percent of New Yorkers from each of the five boroughs support having Walmart in the city. Also from the Amsterdam News, minority students will feel the effect of the closing of a number of Catholic schools across New York City. The Catholic Archdiocese of New York recently announced that 32 Catholic schools across the five boroughs would close by the end of the year. The list includes several schools in ethnic minority neighborhoods like Harlem and the South Bronx. The school closures are expected to spark the largest school system reorganization in history. LDRO Leprenza reports that students in New York City want city council to pass the Student Safety Act. The bill would require the Department of Education and the NYPD to report the number of students who are arrested and suspended. Information on the race, social status, and disabilities of such students would also need to be made public under the potential law. Parents and students recently held a rally in support of the bill. And finally, from the Filipino Reporter, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger recently swore in the first Filipina American to serve as Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court. Tani Cantil Sakuye is also the first Asian to be appointed to the position. Schwarzenegger called her a fine and highly admired jurist and cited her as the example of the American dream. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to Gary and Vianora in the studio. The African Diaspora Film Festival brands itself as the first to focus on the human experience of people of color. The festival started in 1993 and features films from Jamaica to Germany. It starts on the last Friday of November and runs for 18 days. I sat down with one of the founders of the festival, Diara Ndo Spesh, and with David Greaves. His father's film was featured this year. We talked about the need for such a festival and the limitation for black independent filmmakers. The African Diaspora International Film Festival, why was it needed? And how different is it from other such festivals? Well, it's needed uh, because we are the only film festival, um, if not in the country, at least on the East Coast, that presents an international view of the black experience. Uh, most of the other uh, black film festivals in the country focus on anti African American experience. Mm -hmm. And the goal of the festival is to present the richness and diversity of what it means to be black. You have black people in the, on the continent, in Africa. You have black people in Europe, in the Caribbean, Latin America. And the goal of the festival was to present... And of course in America. And in America. <laughs> and in North America. Um, and we wanted to present uh, all of those stories. We wanted to show how much we have in common as black people. We all come from two major, we all have experienced two major realities, mm -hmm. slavery mm -hmm. and colonization. And through those two experiences, we have, exper we have connections. Mm -hmm. uh, even though we may speak different languages, uh, we do have a common experience that it's important for us to be aware of and to share because that's how we can build bridges between communities and we can better understand each other and work together. And so the festival is a way to expose through the media, through films, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. um, the, our stories, you know, our reality, and to and it's so needed because those information are not available in the mainstream. They are not available in the broader uh, in the education, uh, and so the festival is a, is a space where people can learn about who they are mm-hmm. and meet other people as well who share something with them. Speaking of that, uh, who we are, I mean, uh, David, your father, William Greaves, uh, film mm-hmm. Once Upon a Time in Harlem, yes. uh, speaks about, uh, for obvious, obviously, about the Harlem African-American experience. Can sure. you talk to us a little bit more about the film and what he's trying to capture there? Sure. Um, uh, thank, thank you, Gary. Yeah, it's a um, uh, look at the ha- Harlem, Harlem Renaissance. And it's actually like the third incarnation of his look at the Harlem Renaissance. Mm-hmm. He started with uh, fr- From These Roots, mm-hmm. um, which was done all, all with stills back in ni- 1970, 71, 72. And um, that one was, uh, has won like 20 t- odd film festival awards. And, um, but that was all stills. And in conjunction with that, he did a, he filmed a party. And at the party were people like Ar- Arna Bontom, Aaron D- Douglas, Romare Bearden, a lot of uh, the remaining um, folks from, 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 the, from, from the Renaissance, that's right. And um, the, the, these were actually his, his, his friends that he knew and his, his advisors. So um, uh, at this party, they spoke about the Renaissance. And um, uh, so we have all of that, that footage. And then the current, the current footage is um, current view, views of the Renaissance. Um, Amiri Baraka is in there talk, talking about the Renaissance. For folks on, on, on the street, How, Howard D- Dodson, th- things like, like, mm-hmm. like that. So um, uh, the current one is sort of a synth- synthesis and encapsulation ca- of um, his, this, what we call a 40-year journey okay. at the Harlem, looking at the Harlem Renaissance. Diara, you had a fundraiser for Mr. Reeves uh, right. recently. Tell us about that. Well, we met uh, Louise Grieve, uh, Mr. Grieves' uh, spouse, at the IFP Independent Future Project. And she approached us because she was looking for funding to finish the, 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 the film. Uh, the last version of the film. And we offered to do a fundraiser because we are great admirers of Mr. Greaves' work. We've presented a number of his films. Uh, we know him personally, as well as Louis, for many, many years. And, and you know, we, we offered to do what we could to help uh, raise funding. Uh, and so we had a fundraiser at the Schomburg, and it was, I think, very successful. Absolutely. Uh, we had a very nice response. Uh, I think for the first time, some of that footage of the film that was not completed was screened to the public, which was something that they were hesitant to do. But I insisted. I said, mm-hmm. you have to do this because it shows the process mm-hmm. as a filmmaker of Mr. Greaves' you know, work as a filmmaker when you see all of that footage back to back and how he's working. So I think it's very revealing uh, for you know, the talent that he has as a filmmaker. And uh, uh, people responded extremely well. We did raise a little bit of fun, and we hope to raise much more because, and I'm uh, very happy for this opportunity to talk about this uh, in, on this show, uh, because I think maybe someone will hear about <laughs> it and will decide, yes, let's continue Certainly. with this effort. You know, uh, I mean, while the, uh, I call it Mr. Reeves as well, <laughs> uh, film looks back to the Harlem Renaissance and today. Are there any uh, filmmakers in this festival that you currently have that are, are looking at the new America, not to say post-racial America, but the new race paradigm in America? Do you have any films that broaching the subject? Yes, we actually had a film uh, called Stubborn as a Mule, uh, which talked about uh, the need for reparation. Mr. Um, there was several speakers about this. and. The, 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 the films are looking at the, the, the legacy of slavery and the legacy of uh, lynching. And uh, in, in, in one of the films, the filmmaker was comparing the lynching of the past in the 20s to the verbal lynching that Obama is being exposed to today uh, through you know, the Tea Party and other spatial um, parts of the, of the American uh, press movement and some, some, some people. And, and I think that what came out from these films that we showed in the festival was that the, post, the post-racial uh, situation is, 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 is nonsense. It just doesn't, it's, it's, it's absolutely not true. Uh, in fact, it's, there's a really a backlash. That's what we feel. We had a discussion with filmmakers and the question on the panel discussion was, 
is it easier for independent filmmakers, black filmmakers, to make a film today than it was before? And what was the answer, uh, David, the, where we are now? I mean, is it harder for black filmmakers today than it was, let's say, five years ago? Well, that's what, I know it hasn't gotten any easier um, um, in terms of, because um, there's always the fundraising a aspect of it. And now, of course, money is very hard to find and everybody's run, run, running after it. Also, there's a question of um, a quality that is, on the one hand, you do have a greater number of people making it because of the technology that allows people to work uh, very um, in inexpensively. Um, but then there's the question of quality, just because um, you can press the buttons does not mean you're an artiste. <laughs> right. So um, uh, uh, there is that, uh, that, that, that balance where you want to have the um, ex expertise, the passion, and the intellectual cu curiosity reflected in the work. You know, so um, that's what we're looking for. Now, uh, there are, you have scores of films that you've shown in this festival. Now, if people want to uh, look at these films, how do they go about doing that? Well, I mean, if they sign up to our festival website, they can get our newsletter. We have screenings on an ongoing basis in New York City. Uh, we have a cine club every last Friday of the month at Teachers College, Columbia University, which is free of charge. We also have screenings uh, in Chicago and New York. And then we also have some films we distribute. Can you tell us your website address? So yes, www.africandiasporadvd.com. AfricanDiasporaDVD.com, that's where they can see the films that they, couldn't, that they missed in the festival. They can go there and, and get the films there. Unfortunately, we have to leave the conversation here. Uh, David Greaves, Dara and Dara Spesh, yes. thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Appreciate it. When we come back, a Jewish community that says it's been overlooked. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Finally from us tonight, it's common to think that Jews mainly have roots in Europe and the Middle East. However, as Marlene Peralta reports, that's only a portion of the community. Some Jews come from regions as close as the south of the Rio Grande. South Williamsburg in Brooklyn is known for its Hasidic Jew community. However, there are other Jews who also call that neighborhood home. Sarah Siskel is one of them. They are the Orthodox plain. They are the Hasidim, that's the one with the beard till here, and uh, they, they pray the, a little bit different. The same is, the book is the same, but it's different a little bit. Then there's Marcos Masri, whose parents did not speak English or Yiddish. I grew up with the uh, Hasidic um, community over here, um, which the first language is Yiddish. Although Masri's ancestors came from Syria and Egypt, and Siskel's family from Germany, they both have something in common. They are both Hispanic Jews. The presence of Latin American Jews, if you want, started in, with Spain in 1492, after Jews were expelled by uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And uh, there are those who affirm that even on Columbus's ships, there were some Jews on board that had to escape. Masri's ancestors were among the Sephardic Jews who fled Spain. His family settled in Syria and then went to Latin America. I still have family there. My grandfather uh, still lived there. A couple of uh, uncles, cousins. And the part of them they called the Sephardic community. Sephardic is the Hebrew word for Jews from Spain who settled in the Middle East after their expulsion. Many of the Sephardic Jews went in the, uh, after the 15th century and in the 16th century, and they settled there in uh, the, what's today the southwest United States, Central America, and generally the Latin American countries. There's large Sephardic populations in Mexico today of Jews from Syria uh, and Jews from Turkey specifically. Many also arrived in New York. They spoke Spanish or Ladino, as it is called, 
which is a medieval Spanish mixed with Hebrew. A lot of people don't know, but there was 25,000 Spanish-speaking Jews on the Lower East Side of New York in the early 20th century. Uh, they had come from the Balkans, uh, from Greece and Turkey, where they had settled in the 15th century. But they came to America and they established a Sephardic colonies, as they call them here, and they had several Spanish Jewish newspapers, and their lives were, they were Spanish Jews. Sephardics are not the only Spanish-speaking Jews in the Americas. Sarah Siskel's family was part of a different ethnic group, the Ashkenazi Jews who fled Germany during World War II and settled around the world, including Latin America. Her family went to Argentina. They got by boat from Germany out. Then my uncle got them out, two, two brothers. The other brother came later, and uh, he also got out some cousins. Ashkenazim's literal translation is German Jews. Today, the term is defined much more broadly, including Jews from Poland, Lithuania, and Russia. They are the majority of Jews in the world today. <laughs> Rabbi Eisenberg noted that despite the rich diversity within the community, Jews are not exempt from stereotypes in the United States. When a newspaper wants to show a Jew practicing, it was right now the new year, right? It is always a Hasidic Jew. Now, Hasidic Jews are a minority, a small minority within the large family of Jewish people living in New York. But it is much easier to identify in a picture, ah, he has a beard, a little black, huh? black hat, you know, black coat, he's Jewish. Do I look Jewish or I don't look Jewish? Unless I go like this and I show my, my, my kippah, no one would know that I'm Jewish, right? Or at least I, I put a sign here. And it gets even more complicated for people when he says he's Latin American. People have to start learning that not all Latinos, or those who come from Latin American countries, from Brazil, from the Caribbean, all not, do not look the same, do not think the same, do not have the same eyes, the same color. They're all people of different, and whatever difference they are, they're Jews, Catholic, Protestants, Seventh-day Adventists, whatever they want to be, as long as they are good and they don't harm anybody else. But, and that's how, that's how we have to look at it. And people have to learn, yes, there can be Eisenberg, who is a Latino Americano and speaks Spanish very well, I assure you. But if you grew up uh, in my worldview or other Sephardic Jews, when you hear these names, you automatically think Jewish. And these names um, vary and can include names such as Gomez, Trujillo, Pardo. These are Jewish names from Jewish people. For independent sources, Marlene Peralta. That's our show. Before we go, we'd like to wish you happy holidays on behalf of the staff here on Independent Sources. Till the next time, be independent-minded.